Hey, Keith, thank you for coming in today to do this uh, interview. You know, you have a remarkable background, uh, you know, as a doctor and, and just the transformational leadership throughout everything you do. And it's across many domains and just really, really outstanding. And then there's the legacy of your family as well. Again, all of it outstanding. So let's delve into some of that. And uh, but first of all, I just want to thank you for taking the time. Well, thank you, Stephen. It's an honor to be here. And it was a pleasure to meet you last week uh, out in Qatar and get to know you. So, Keith, you know, my, my, my audience is very mixed. I have CEOs and investors and scientists. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a broad mix uh, of people in, in my audience. And, you know, they're always, you know, sort of curious, you know, when 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 people have this wonderful background you have, you know, what were the inflection points that really made you this wonderful person that you are today? You know, maybe it's two or three, maybe it's one, but you know, something that transformed you throughout your life. And it could be at the age of three or five or when you're in school, et cetera. Well, I think the most important thing was my father, uh, Paul Terasaki, who passed away around five years ago. But, uh, you know, he grew up in Los Angeles and he became a professor at UCLA. He did a lot of research on organ transplantation and oh, he used to come home and tell me about what what was going on, and and uh, it was a very exciting field because when he started in the late 1950s, I mean, organ transplantation wasn't being performed. It wasn't possible because all the organs would be rejected unless it was between an identical twin. But you know, over the next 30 or 40 years. Uh, the field really developed, and so it was a really exciting time. And I, I got to hear a lot of it. I got to meet a lot of his uh, colleagues, and <clears throat> you know, now we we see you know bone marrow and kidney and heart and liver uh, transplants uh, doing pretty well. There's still a little ways to go, but it certainly has changed over the last forty years. So I got <clears throat> a lot of experience to. Uh, medical research as I was growing up, and I, I did become a physician. I'm a radiologist. But my father, <clears throat> um, he really, his passion was medical research. And so <clears throat> during his career, he started donating his money. He donated money to UCLA for their medical research. And then he also started <clears throat> uh, a research institute and he, um, so this is a, um, a private nonprofit uh, research institute in Los Angeles. And so he started it. And at first he was doing <clears throat> transplantation research, but now we do um, research there that <clears throat> we want, well, we've branched away from transplant. And um, now we have about 50 researchers there and uh, I'm on the board there, and um, yeah, it's very exciting, some of the things that, that we're trying to do there, I think. Yeah, and, I, and, and the Research Institute is the Terasaki Institute for Biomedical Innovation, and sometimes there's a sort of acronym, TIBI, <laughs> you know, T-I for Terasaki Institute and Biomedical Innovation, B-I, so TIBI uh, is uh, sort of, and so when we refer to TIBI, that's the Terasaki Institute of Biomedical Innovation, and really a world leader in many respects of all the work that you uh, that's being done there. And then you indicated that you're on the board, but you actually chair, <laughs> chair the board and, and you chair the uh, Terasaki Foundation, which uh, provides funding for the Terasaki Institute. So it's just a marvelous uh, institute doing just such fine work and you carry on that legacy, but you're also a noted radiologist as well. And you, you do some, and continue to do some great work and, it, it, when you reflect on radiology, do, do you see that evolving as much as as in your you know like in the biomedical innovation side on the Terasaki Institute and and things like uh, you know embracing tech, uh, technology and and tech transformation or you you still feel that like maybe they're in the middle and and not quite there yet? Um, yeah, the radiology. Well, it's actually been a great career for me, you know, really interesting. And um, 
like I mentioned with transplantation, you know, radiology has really grown, <clears throat> you know, since I've been in there. So like when I had my residency training, well, we really weren't doing MRI studies. <laughs> and, <clears throat> um, you know, so MRI has come up in these high speed CAT scans and everything. <clears throat> and so a lot of very interesting um, uh, new imaging has come up and has made radiology a great field for me to be in. Plus, <clears throat> I was an interventional radiologist, which meant I did a lot of procedures, <clears throat> a lot of angiograms and angioplasties. And <clears throat> that field also grew tremendously from when I started. And um, we got to use a lot of interesting medical devices, you know, that, that companies would try. And <clears throat> so I got really good exposure to that. Uh, lately, <clears throat> um, I've mostly been reading CAT scans and MRIs. And unfortunately, most of the patients are cancer patients. <clears throat> you know, they get diagnosed with cancer, we do a scan, and then they go on some sort of chemotherapy or something. And then we do a scan in several more months to see how they're doing. And, <clears throat> and then we do follow-ups. And so, yeah, most cancer patients get lots of scans um, throughout their life. And <clears throat> uh, we as radiologists, you know, see all of those and compare it with the ones before. And so we know what cancer patients uh, go through. And um, that's made me, well, interested in trying to come up with better solutions for cancer in particular. Um, do, do you feel that uh, artificial intelligence will help in the field of radiology? Or do you think it's a little bit too early yet? Or, uh, you know, because you're so involved, uh, where, where do you think uh, the applications will be in terms of using AI to uh, to look over these images that are being produced, right? So I think inevitably it will. And there are some AI programs now to like read mammograms or read head, head CT scans. <clears throat> and um, I think... Um, Right now, you know, if you look today, maybe it's not quite ready um, to take over, but there's no question in my mind in five to 10 years, a lot of radiology studies will be read out by computer and maybe a human radiologist will look at it afterward and confirm it. But, <clears throat> you know, computers have such an advantage and they're so quick and, you know, you can get it done, you can get a reading in a in a few seconds. And uh, um, so I, I think that we see that coming and most radiologists realize that and some are trying to plan for the future. But uh, overall, it's a, a good thing. Like I remember when I was in medical school, we had a whole class on learning how to read an EKG. So <laughs> we'd look at an EKG strip and we'd have to calculate the rhythm and then decide, was this going on? Was that going on? Was this going on? That's all computerized now. And so now you, someone gets an EKG, the, the answer spits out. And um, probably the same thing will happen, you know, with with many radiology studies. You know, it's it's quite a, amazing. You know, I, I, I bought I, this is a, uh Apple Ultra watch that just came out. And I'm just amazed. I missed my first uh, eye watch and uh, or smart watch and I was really surprised at all the capabilities it has like uh, oxygen saturation and it does it analyzes your heartbeat and things like that and then also has EKG in in the in the watch and and then you can get all these apps um, that can analyze your sleep and so on it, it can even tell you uh, if you've got deep sleep it's got REM <laughs> light sleep and it and it tracks uh, pretty good from what I understand. So what are your feelings about these kinds of devices, these wearables where you're getting uh, sensors built in? And do you think that's going to transform your field as well? Because, you know, there's radiology elements to that, right? Yeah, I think um, uh, those type of sensors uh, will be important. Uh, we're actually working on some, you know, at our institute, but um you know, there's talk that you could pick up um, things from the sweat and like you could monitor your drug levels if you're on a special drug that, <clears throat> you know, you need to have a certain level of. And uh, 
oh, say you missed the dose or something. Well, it, it could help you try to decide what to do. I, I have an eye watch also. I'll just tell you the other day I was, um, I think I was playing tennis and suddenly <laughs> it went off and said, did you take a fall? Should we call 911? <laughs> and uh, I was fine and I, um, I couldn't reset it for a little while. And so it sent me another message, but that shows that it's not perfected yet. And you may need some human um, oversight. I mean, at, at least for a while, but um, yeah, there's, there's no question. You know, I'll just tell you, like we're working on con, if you can believe it. I mean, I can find it hard to be, we're working on contact lenses that could, you know, uh, analyze the tears. And then if you can believe it, send it electronically, you know, to your, to your phone, or it could maybe measure pressure for glaucoma or something like that. And so, yeah, I think within five or 10 years, <clears throat> these type of, of products uh, will be coming out. And yeah, it's a sign of technology. I mean, you look at where we were 20 years ago, <laughs> you know, compared to where we're going to, where, you know, we're going to probably make that same leap in five, five years or something like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I know when the watch first came out, I kind of ignored it. <laughs> but but then I just got one and I go, wow, it's it's quite remarkable what it can do, right? And uh, Yeah, it's like computers, though. The problem is they're, they could do so much and you're only using like 5% of its, of its uh, capabilities. And uh, I mean, that's the way I feel about every, you know, a lot of things. I don't... I try to learn, like I have a Tesla and I, I, I try to do some of the functions, but I can't do all the functions that it, <laughs> that it offers. And same thing with the iWatch, the iPhone, my laptop, everything. Um, yeah, it seems, well, at least for me, it seems like I'm just using a small fraction of its capabilities, but still it's much more than was available five years ago. Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, I've, you know the um i14 pro max i got one on order it's coming in a few days and i it's got an a16 bionic chip and that has what 16 trillion trans or 16 billion transistors i think something like that and it can do 17 trillion operations per second <laughs> I mean, that's like a supercomputer and uh it's just amazing right <laughs> yeah and you know if you want to stay up on things it's sort of crazy but you got to buy something new every two years it seems like yeah exactly if you don't have the latest iphone well my kids have something better than i do and you know uh, uh, you know they, they they say oh i'm using old stuff so yeah technology is uh moving at an incredible pace you know so you know we 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 talked about your your prior work. We talked about your your father who did amazing work, and in fact, uh, he, he's really responsible for this idea of tissue matching, right? And and uh, what groundbreaking and allowed trans uh, organ transplantation uh, uh, transplantation to occur uh, globally because of this matching, and it's really precision and personalized medicine, right? Because you can get somebody you don't even know <laughs> and you match to you and that's really personalized and it's precision and then therefore you you can get this uh, transplantation occurring and, you, and your father was a big uh, uh, you know pioneer in that area and of course the legacy continues with you with the Terasaki Institute and so let's let's talk about the Terasaki Institute you know uh, a few years ago you hired a, a new CEO so Tell me what inspired uh, to hire uh, Ali and what changes do you think that, uh, or what other opportunities do you think that opened by by bringing in Ali into uh, being your uh, new CEO of the Terasaki Research Institute? Yes, we hired uh, Ali Karim Husseini. And, uh, you know, he trained at uh, MIT and he worked at Harvard for a while and, um, uh, he was at UCLA for a bit, and um, we became interested in him because uh, he, well, I think he had this sort of unique view of um, trying to innovate and translate um, his discoveries into products. So that was his, his well, that is his, his key mission and, and drive. You know, he, like a lot of people, you know, trained at academic 
uh, centers and uh, I, I, you know, I, I think very highly of academic centers and I'm very closely related with uh, UCLA. But, you know, the, most of the researchers there, well, they, they've, a lot of them focus on basic science and they, they have to teach and certainly they have to publish. And um, we wanted this institute and, uh, and uh, Ali was a driving force in this to try to do research that will lead to, uh, well, relatively quickly lead to products and lead to uh, things that will significantly <clears throat> impact society and the, the health and well-being of, of, of people. So <clears throat> at the Institute, um, we do projects that we think will lead to significant products and you know, if it doesn't seem to be going that way, well, we could we would drop it. And you know, we're not as interest or not as focused on publishing. Uh, we do have students rotating through us, but you know, we're not as focused as the university in, in educating. So you know, we have a number of products that we hope to hope come out of our institute that we could spin out. And um, that's to me, it's really exciting that we're able to do that. Yeah, and I guess this goes into this idea of translational research, which really means translating research into usable products and, and something that can be scaled globally. And really, ultimately, that's for the benefit of humanity and benefit of the world, right? And, and especially in the work that's being done by the Terasaki Research Institute for Biomedical Innovation or, or TV. And, and, you know, ultimately, when you, you, when you do research, it, you can't just stay at the knowledge stage. You got to do something with it, all the way, right? So, and that's, and I think that's just wonderful. This idea of a translational aspect, you know, making it useful. So, let, let's delve into some of that translational work because it's, I mean, it is absolutely amazing. I know that you're doing um, it's sort of like new tests for cancer cells. Can you talk about that work? Uh, yeah. So. Um... You know, I think if you look at uh, cancer treatment right now, there are certainly some cancers which are very difficult to treat once it becomes metastatic. And, uh, you know, at that point, they usually try some sort of chemotherapy or maybe even immunotherapy. But for each patient, um, it's a difficult decision for the clinician to decide which chemotherapy agent to try, but, you know, they, they try the first agent and <clears throat> the patient, uh, well, gets very hopeful and tries it. And usually they try it for three or four months and then they get a CAT scan or something and compare it to what it was before. And, <clears throat> you know, in, in some cases, the patient's very lucky that the tumor has responded, but in the difficult cancers, the tumor hasn't responded or continues to grow. And then at that point, the clinician's <clears throat> meet again and then decide to try the second line treatment and they try that. And if that doesn't work, they go on to a third line. <clears throat> and during this whole time, the patient unfortunately is getting worse or could get a complication from one of the chemotherapy agents. So, <clears throat> you know, we look at that as sort of an opportunity um, to improve. And so one of our scientists, uh, Dr. Shilling Shen, um, he's developed a test that other people have tried to do something very similar, but he takes a biopsy from these tumor cells, the initial biopsy, and they put it through this little machine and it sort of grinds it up and makes it into little, what are called microspheres. And so they're small <clears throat> little um, bundles of tumor cells with their surrounding tissue, uh, which over the years we found it's important not only to study the tumor cells, but to have them in their local um, environment with the surrounding cells. So we get these little uh, micro organospheres <clears throat> and we can uh, plate them out and test like 200 different agents against them. So we could try a whole bunch of chemotherapy agents as well as combinations. And <clears throat> we could tell within two weeks, which of those chemotherapy agents is most effective against that particular tumor for that patient. <clears throat> and so 
we hope that this test will be able to uh, guide the clinician and say, no, oh, no, no, you should use this other one as, as the first choice. And um, they've tried this test on metastatic uh, colon cancer, which is sometimes, well, sometimes difficult to treat. And so it was, this test was tried at MD Anderson and the um, initial results are, are good. And um, so now this test is being tried on diff other different types of tumors at about a dozen um, uh, cancer centers uh, across the world actually. And you know we hope to see if this test works. And so we'll probably know within a year. Now there have been prior attempts to form these and people have made organospheres. Now ours are micro organospheres, but <clears throat> people have tried other ways to see if they could predict which chemotherapy will work. And um, that, that hasn't been successful yet, but our, um, our test shows initial promise. So we're very excited about it. And of course, this is an example of personalized medicine because even if someone has metastatic breast cancer, it may be a little bit different than someone else's metastatic breast cancer, and it may respond to a certain chemotherapy, uh, whereas the other patient may be best with a, another chemotherapy. So it's a different level of, of cancer treatment than, than we've been used to you know, for the last uh, 20 years or something like that. So we're very hopeful that that, that, that will work. I mean, it, you know, the, the work uh, sounds really amazing. The fact that uh, you can take a biopsy, you can uh, create these little droplets, which really precisely represents the patient because you're taking it from the patient. And it's not just the tumor, but also any other mutations that could be present in that tumor. So it's a, it's a heterogeneous sample of that tumor. And, and the surrounding cells, the immune cells, and so on, so that it really is a, a, re, a true representation of that person. So that's very personalized, and it's very precise. And because it's occurring at, at a micro scale, then you get more of a 2D ability to analyze it, and then you can apply machine learning and, and um, scanning technologies uh, computationally to I guess, to standardize this and to automate it. And the fact that you could then replicate this across hundreds of different samples and in a very short time period. So not two months or six months and so on. You can do this in, in like you said, a matter of days, really, right? Um, under yeah. two weeks, typically. So that's, <laughs> I think that's amazing, right? Yeah, we 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 have good hope for it. And um as I said, we'll we'll know uh, hopefully within a year how this works on different tumors, and yeah, we we can envision a day when a biopsy is done and the sample could be sent, you know, on ice and to somewhere, and they run this test. And uh, again, the the hope is that we could get an answer out within two weeks, and. Um, the patient will be able to start on that. But a lot of work still needs to be done because we have to prove that the test really works and it's better than the oncologist choosing what they think is best. And so there needs to be um, uh, sort of controlled studies to show that the test is better than uh, what the oncologist thinks is best. So that's why it's going to take a little while. Yeah, but the promise, I think it's just so, uh, it'll transform um, therapeutics, diagnostics, and even drug discovery, right? Because- Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, so one major uh, benefit of this test is it would hopefully help patient care and get them on the right chemotherapy and prolong their survival and decrease the chance of complication and- and everything. The other um, benefit is uh, in drug development, as you said, because right now when a company <clears throat> has a um, drug that they think may work on cancer, well, they, they do animal studies and then eventually they do, they do a human trial, which costs you know so much money 
and takes so many years to do a human trial. And so <clears throat> we hope that this test could be used somewhere along the line, either before the animal trial or after the animal trial. And <clears throat> uh, companies can try hundreds of, of different chemicals <clears throat> against uh, different patients' tumor cells to see which works. And sometimes, <clears throat> you know, a, uh, a promising chemotherapy agent is turned down by the FDA because it only worked on 25% of the patients or something like that. And, you know, another one worked on 30%. And so they may turn down the 25% or something. But <clears throat> if we could show that, hey, this works on the 25% that didn't work on the 30%, well, that drug is valuable. And so <clears throat> um, we think it could... <clears throat> um, help um, more drugs get uh, more easily or, uh, well, eventually get approved. So yes, a test like this, we think has lots of applications. Yeah, and I, I mean, uh, it'll accelerate. I can see the acceleration of this kind of process um, at a lower cost. And uh, the fact that you can create these, really these representations of a real person and and uh, duplicate it right and 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 the fact that it creates a uh, these little droplets are really a, a you know pretty good representation of not just the tumor but the homogeneous or heterogeneous aspects of tumor and then you can do compound uh, drug therapies and try that it, you know and um i just think it's just the remarkable work i mean uh i i think it's Going to, uh, I believe, anyways, that it will transform um, the whole field. So, um, you know, I, I, it's a celebration again to the work that's being done at the Terrasecki Institute. You, you're also working on uh, taking uh, muscle biopsies of cattle and then <laughs> growing it in culture. I just think, again, this is just sort of really marvelous work. And just as a bit of foundation for the audience, you know, there's this. A uh, gentleman named Yamaraka, and he, he's a Japanese scientist, and he won a Nobel Prize where he could take a, an adult cell, and he figured if you apply these four molecules, so they call them Yamaraka factors, you could actually regress it down to being a stem cell, in fact, a pluripotent stem cell, and then you can, and then through the work of people like Hans Cleaver, you could actually then grow organoids like uh, a, mi a mini versions of an organ or or different parts of the of, of a human, but you could do that with animals too, right? You could culture meat, for example, and things like that. So that maybe that's maybe the little bit of the science behind it, from my understanding. And uh, he correct me if I'm wrong, but tell me about this muscle biopsy of cattle. And yeah, it was sort of an interesting idea, but it started, you know, with some of the experience of some of our scientists with cell culture, you know, which has been around for a long time, growing cells and culture. So what we found is we could start with a cow and take a biopsy and get a few muscle cells from that cow. And if we add the right nutrients to it, we could get those cells to divide. And we could get those muscle cells to divide uh, quickly and on a big scale. So I think now we we could start with a biopsy and we have this 200 liter um, container that <clears throat> we could add the cells to and we add different uh, nutrients and we could get the cells to divide and end up with 200 liters of ground beef, ground well. And it's, it's, it's essentially pure myocytes, uh, pure muscle cells. And <clears throat> so we've been, well, one, we're trying to scale it up, and two, we're trying to improve on this a little bit. I could tell you I had a taste of this, and uh, it, it comes out white because there's no blood in it, and uh, it looks funny, and it, it tastes very bland, but it's probably very high in protein and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, I feel I could just add some mustard and onions and have it as a hamburger. But <clears throat> we're trying to improve on it. And... The reason why we think this is a worthwhile project is twofold. One, 
you know, if we could ever get this to grow up, uh, to grow in large volume and people to buy it um, and eat it rather than a hamburger, well, we think it's more healthy. You know, it doesn't have all the fat and grease, you know, that a, a hamburger has. <clears throat> and so we could sort of control the nutrient. Uh, well, we have a much better uh, nutrient profile compared to a regular hamburger. The other main advantage is, of course, to the environment. Uh, we don't, uh, if we, if a lot of this was eaten rather than using cows, um, we would save a lot on um, farmland and rainwater usage and pesticides and methane production. And we wouldn't have to slaughter as many cows. Um, and, you know, if you look at the demand for meat, um, you know, people say it's growing across the world and that uh, developing countries want more meat. And um, so we think if we could uh, make more meat, that will help. You know, there's lots of countries where the rainforests are being taken down so that they can have more agriculture land for more, <laughs> more cattle. And so, well, if we could reverse that trend and if we could make a product that tastes like meat, um, but is healthy and um, doesn't hurt the environment. Well, we think that's a, a great thing. And you'd be like eating a guilt-free hamburger. You know, every time I eat a hamburger, I think, oh, this is, I, I shouldn't get a double hamburger because that's probably bad for me or, you know, it's bad for the environment. But uh, yeah, if we could grow this meat in large, large, uh, amounts we think that could change change really change the world and uh, so we're trying to scale it up now we are buying a new um well we're renting a new property so we could get a, a giant vat <laughs> and we're going to see how how that works out now of course there are some challenges like it has to be affordable it can't cost more than a regular hamburger and so people have been working on cultured meat for quite a while. And uh, the difficulty has been the price of it. I think the first hamburger I don't know, cost like $10,000 to, <laughs> to make. But yeah, so we're trying to make it, um, we're trying to make it at a good, at a good price. Now, of course, cultured meat, um, not really available yet. Uh, but again, that's where we're hoping to go. The other way is the meat substitutes, the plant plant type meats. And, you know, I'm in favor of those. I, I, I eat those whenever I can. Um, uh, the Impossible Burger and the Beyond Burger. But um, I think that if if we came out with something that really looked and tastes, and, and it is meat, uh, we, we think that that has an advantage. So that, that's one of our projects that we're working on. Yeah, and I guess because you're, you're uh, growing these cell cultures of meat, uh, uh, muscle tissue then you you can or muscle cells you can add your own nutrients and your own other kinds of fats and i stand corrected this has nothing to do with yamanaka or or, no, or that's cleavers work right this is something. not really but but it's it's related to getting cells to grow right. and um yeah but it's i guess it's as i understand it's not that hard to get the cells to grow if you feed them the right if you feed them the right things but yes, in the future, you know, we're finding that, oh, if you just eat a bunch of myocytes, muscle cells, well, it's pretty bland. And uh, as I said, I could eat it. But, you know, so we're thinking of adding in back little bits of fat, and maybe the um, beneficial fat or, or, or something, and uh, to make it a little more tasty. And so we're actually thinking of, uh, you know, not enough research is done on nutrition, but, you know, if we can get some answers, you know, maybe there's a type of meat that would be best for pregnant women. Maybe there's meat that is better for diabetics or better for people who are elderly or people who have cancer or young people growing up. I mean, um, maybe, uh, you know, if we have control of the meat, we could... Uh, sort of tailor it for the person's uh, best need. Because, you know, I think if you look 
<laughs> look through um, ancient times, you know, people always ate meat. And I think for some reason, there must be something in meat that people like to eat and animals like to eat. And um, so if we could preserve that, but yet make it healthy, uh, you know, I think that's what we're striving for. Yeah, and, I, and like you earlier alluded to, it's, you know, we don't get into animals. You, do, you don't need animals and things like that, right? So, and I'll... Oh, yeah, the, the agriculture industry, I mean, I don't know the statistics. I mean, I hear different things, but, you know, so much of our land is dedicated uh, to raising cattle, and so much of our water is used for cattle. And you think about, like, pesticide use, it's all... You know, it's used all over for the crops that the uh, animals eat. And, you know, our, our meat actually would come out sterile. And so, you know, you don't have to worry. You, you know, <laughs> we don't have to worry about getting these mad cow diseases and things like that. I mean, hopefully. And, um, you yeah, know, so I think there's, there's uh, many benefits. And cultured meat where we make ground beef, well, that's sort of the, the first step. And as I said, maybe in five years, it will be available. But just like the rest of technology, you know, we may have cultured chicken, we may have cultured fish, we may have sushi, you know, maybe you and I could choose a, a sushi to, that's grown in a lab. And you, know, you could be assured that, hey, that's a real piece of, of whatever fish. And um, so, yeah, and then steaks are, Another challenge, it turns out that it's the texture of the steak that's important, but, you know, there are people making, well, they call them scaffolds out of collagen, and then you grow these meat cells in the scaffold and it tries to make a steak. We're focusing on ground beef right now, and we think there's a lot of use for ground, for hamburgers in the U.S., and you could use them in burritos and tacos and things like that. And we think across the world, you know, there's a huge uh, market for, for beef, but this may just be the start. And it, it could be like, you know, genetically modified vegetables. I mean, when they first came out, oh, everybody was very suspect about it. And some people were saying, oh, I don't want to eat, you know, a tomato that's been genetically modified. But then you now you find out, oh, the tomatoes are taste much be better and they're, they're <laughs> fresher and they're bigger. And you're not, you don't even know when you eat a genetically modified uh, uh, vegetable now. So maybe in 20 years, again, you'll get a hamburger that tastes good and good for you, and but it's grown in a lab. So that, that's sort of wishful thinking. But uh, anyway, that's, that's one of our other projects. You know, the, you know, we're we're running into the last parts of our interview here, but you know, I know you're doing a lot of stem cell research and uh, and and organs on a chip, and you're doing wearable sensors and biological implants and vaccines that don't need refrigeration. So, in the remaining, uh, let's say, ten minutes, uh, pick pick uh, which ones you want to talk about, or maybe you can talk about all of them in about ten minutes. Um, well, I could talk about the vaccines. Um, you know, as we've all seen with the COVID, you know, vaccines are very important. Um, <clears throat> one uh, major problem with a COVID vaccine is that if you look worldwide, it's not easily <clears throat> available uh, in certain countries. And certain countries still have less than 10% of their population vaccinated. And as I understand it, I mean, there are multiple reasons for it but one of them is is distribution in that the vaccines need to be uh, refrigerated and uh, transported and then taken to little villages and you know kept in refrigeration you know until the people come in to get their vaccine and so if you don't have refrigeration it's a very limiting uh, factor so we're working on um, well, it's based on these micro needles, which um, it's a, a little patch, maybe an inch by an inch, that have like a hundred of these really tiny needles, and uh, they're called micro needles. And so you could take a patch and put it on your skin, 
and you actually, because the needles are so small, you don't, you don't feel it. And so micro needles are being used for other things, but we're trying to <clears throat> use it for vaccines. And um, we think we have a way <clears throat> to have uh, the vaccine. Now, normally a vaccine is a liquid, of course, in a, in a vial and it's unstable with heat. So <clears throat> we think that we have a way of uh, essentially crystallizing the vaccine and having it in these little micro needles. So it's not a liquid, but it, it goes in with the needle. And if you can believe this, the needle actually breaks off. So you, you stick this patch on there and, you, and you slide it off and you have these tiny little, I mean, they're very tiny uh, <clears throat> micro needles that stay in your skin and it dissolves with time. And what's left is the vaccine, which turns into liquid once it reaches water. So we think, I mean, we're still working on this, but our early results suggest that we're able to do this. And so the uh, advantage is uh, we could have these micro needles that contain stable, but the vaccine in a stable form, and they could be shipped uh, without refrigeration. The other thing is, as I mentioned, these <clears throat> little tiny micro needles dissolve with time, but we could actually control that. And so we're looking at, <clears throat> you know, how most vaccines you need one shot and then you wait, whatever, a couple months and you get a booster. And the booster, so the first one primes the immune system, but then the booster hits the primed immune system and you get much more of an immune response. But we hope with these micro needles, and if we could um, get them to dissolve at different rates, well, maybe one a person could have one shot, and then with time it keeps releasing a little bit more of the vaccine, and uh, we think that well that might really stimulate the immune system and could be better than two shots. And you know we know that a lot of people get one shot and they don't go back for their booster or something like that. So this would also help that. But anyway, our main thing is to um, try to make uh, vaccines that don't need to be refrigerated. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, just the COVID vaccine, but you know, almost almost any vaccine. And the other thing is these micro needle patches. I mean, you don't necessarily need a, a nurse to put them on, and in fact, you could put it on yourself. So you know, we we hope. Oh gosh, maybe you could mail it you know, in certain situations to people and they vaccinate themselves and it doesn't hurt. So um, that's something that we're working on. I mean, that's really fascinating. You know, you have these micro needles that you don't feel. And so, and then I guess you can use a variation of that to uh, look at interstitial fluid and look for biomarkers to indicate some kind of condition ahead of time right or or to do monitoring and this would then go into wearable sensors is, is that correct or or not yeah the, the, we have this other product out it's with the micro needles it's not these dissolvable micro needles but it's a, a micro needle patch that you could put on and then we apply a little bit of suction on it <clears throat> and so you leave it on for 10 minutes and you get a tiny amount <clears throat> of fluid <clears throat> so the fluid you're getting is interstitial fluid so and then you could run tests on that. <clears throat> and so we think it's interesting for certain compounds. <clears throat> well, everything is measured in blood, you know, so you, <clears throat> you draw some blood and you spin it down, you run some tests. <clears throat> but the problem with blood is there's a lot of uh, other proteins that interfere and things like that. Whereas interstitial fluid um, is a little bit different than blood. And it's still a science that hasn't been figured out, <clears throat> but we're, uh, yeah, so we have this method of um, sampling interstitial fluid, and sometimes it's different than the blood level. And so we're trying to see <clears throat> where, where it could be uh, important. But <clears throat> yes, someone theoretically could uh, put a micro patch and sample their interstitial fluid and Maybe they want to do it once a month for certain things or um, uh, different times. So, yeah, hopefully this 
age of always needing to draw blood with a big needle uh, may be partially replaced by <clears throat> using micro patches, uh, micro needles in a, in a patch. And uh, yeah, we've shown that you just need a tiny amount of fluid and you could um, uh, sample it for hundreds of different chemicals. And so, yeah, that's, we think that that's gonna become important uh, down the line. You know, we have time for maybe one more um, and then you can choose, and this would be like your stem cell research or organs on a chip or biological implants. <laughs> Well, if I could, maybe I could switch and talk about a little bit about our family foundation. Okay. And, uh, you know, we've talked about our family foundation supporting medical research, and that's certainly the most important thing we do. But one thing that our family has uh, started doing is uh, trying to support other causes that are important in our city. And um, so like, <clears throat> you know, Los Angeles, I, I don't know about other cities, but, you know, probably our most challenging problem is the homeless. And so <clears throat> we've been supporting uh, homeless medical care for over 20 years. And um, I'm chair of the board of a clinic, the major healthcare clinic <clears throat> in uh, Skid Row in Los Angeles. And um, I can tell you, we have lots of challenges there. The number of homeless is increasing. There's a lot of <clears throat> um, mental health problems and drug abuse problems. <clears throat> and one of the things that we're really focused on in the clinic over the last 20 years is uh, infectious disease. And so you think about things like <clears throat> uh, HIV and hepatitis and sexually transmitted disease, tuberculosis, and COVID. <clears throat> I mean, those, the, the incidence of all of those infections is much higher in Skid Row amongst the homeless <clears throat> compared to the rest of the city. And it's very important, I think, that we try to keep those um, <clears throat> infectious disease under control. I mean, if, well, so like COVID was the latest challenge, of course, and you know, if you let homeless people get COVID and if you don't take care of them and they pass to every homeless patient, soon will come, they'll affect all the workers down in Skid Row, the, the people are trying to help them out and feed them. And um, I mean, it would really be a problem. So <clears throat> we spend a lot of time trying to protect the homeless from COVID. And if, if a homeless person did get COVID, we figured out a way to isolate them. And so that's been a, a major challenge. But all of those diseases I mentioned, like tuberculosis and hepatitis and HIV, um, they are higher in the homeless. Uh, but I could tell you, if you don't have it under control, it's a threat to the rest of the population. So our, our family has been supporting uh, work like that for the homeless. We, we try to look at what we think are major problems. And so homeless is one. Another one we feel is uh, climate change. And so we um, support research, <clears throat> you know, looking at climate change and the environment. I try to do my little part. You know, we have a solar <laughs> roof and things, but, you know, we support the research at, at UCLA. And then the last um, thing that we feel is important is if you look at, <clears throat> Uh, you know, we do most of our work here in Los Angeles, but there's a tremendous disparity between the affluent and the um, uh, the indigent, the low-income populations. And <clears throat> I think one of the keys is uh, early education. And so kids who get to go to um, a good preschool, accredited preschool, and maybe learn how to read before they start kindergarten, are at such an advantage <clears throat> over a child who doesn't go to preschool and then starts kindergarten as their first school. And, you know, they don't know how to read. They don't know any math. They don't know how to behave in a classroom situation. <clears throat> and so they're constantly behind, you know, their other peers across the city or when they get together. And so <clears throat> I, uh, while we believe that, uh, 
uh, education in, <clears throat> uh, in the young is important. And studies have shown that if you could help the people, the younger they are, you get more bang for your buck than, for instance, if you give money as scholarships in college or in high school or something, you try to, uh, you know, help someone. I mean, that's great. You try to help someone in, in high school, but we think that you get more bang for your buck <clears throat> in uh, helping uh, children the younger they are. So we're involved in that. And um, uh, yeah, that's what our, our foundation does. So let me uh, sort of summarize what I'm hearing then. You know, we, we talked about that you're the chairman of the Terasaki Family Foundation, and you're also chairman of the board of the Terasaki Institute for Biomedical Innovation, which is trying to scale translational work, uh, research that can be used globally, and addressing some of the major uh, challenges in, in an affordable way and so on. You're also chairman of the board of directors of the uh, Wesley Health Clinics, and this is the work on the Skid Row uh, in the downtown areas of Los Angeles. You're also involved in supporting climate research with uh, UCLA and also early education and, and encompassing diversity, equity, and inclusion because you, you feel that the earlier you get, the better it is in terms of life outcomes. And I guess you get into epigenetic effects as well, right? Generational, addressing generational uh, challenges. You're also on the board of the Colburn uh, School of Music, the Metropolitan YMCA and uh, UCLA Life Sciences. Did I miss anything or did I get anything wrong? No, those are those are them. And uh, yeah, it keeps me busy, but um, yeah, I'm a little bit careful about what I sign up to do. Yeah. And uh, a lot of those things, you know, I, I'm not, I'm certainly not involved in any of the day-to-day work in in most of them so i feel like i could i could handle them but it keeps me busy um you know i still work as a radiologist part-time but yeah the rest of the time i'm involved in these these uh different uh endeavors and uh i i it's fun for me i think um you know we hope to accomplish something with uh medical care and at the same time, you know, help general society. So, um, yeah, pretty busy at times. You know, Keith, uh, we have about another minute left. Uh, do you have any final recommendations that you want to give to the audience? <laughs> no, uh, I would just say that, you know, these seem like challenging times, but you know, I'm trying to stay positive and do what I can and uh, not get involved in little disputes and things like that. And uh, as I said, try to be positive and move, move forward. And uh, yeah, that's that's about all I could really say. Well, Keith, you know, again, uh, just the work is outstanding. It's remarkable, definitely for the benefit of humanity and Earth, Earth ecosystems in such a positive way across so many dimensions, across so many uh, domains. Uh, uh, you know, I just, uh, I, I'm just awestruck. It's amazing and it's outstanding. So thank you again, Keith, for coming in and sharing your insights with our audience. Well, thank you, Stephen. It's, it's been a pleasure and uh yeah, it's been great to get to know you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.